Okay, just to get started, I wanted to do a quick call, uh, call roll really quick. Anna, are you on? Bill, are you on? I am on, ready to go. Awesome, welcome back. Uh, the moderator can double check, but it looks like Anna has disconnected from the call. She might be in the attendee list. Yeah, she's in the attendees. Okay. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, Anna, you've been made a panelist again. Can you do a quick mic check? They're doing roll call. Hello, I'm here. Awesome, welcome back. All right, so to start again, we left, we just finished up section six, uh, item six, and now we'll move on to item seven, which is discussion and possible actions on optician regulations. And moderator, if we're able to move Mark Johnson up to panelist, and then Mr. Johnson and Ms. Leeper, um, please begin. Thank, thank you, uh, Adam. Um, members, um, what we're doing today is uh, as part of our um, the dispensing optician committee's uh, statutory mandated duties. Um, we're proposing a some small changes to the optician program regulations. Um, you'll note that uh, this committee over the course of three or four meetings has done a pretty comprehensive statutory review. And um, that actually will, we will be reading that back as part of our next uh, agenda item. But this agenda item kind of builds on that with um, making some changes to our regulations that um, are, are pretty basic. Um, we're not proposing anything major uh, just because the optician um, statutory changes that um, we're looking at um, to potentially get into uh, a bill form next year or the year after would likely spawn a lot of the changes. So the regulations we're proposing today are limited to codifying um, uh, initial registration forms into, uh, into regulation and then also um, uh, renewal registration forms, and then also to align a couple of fees that we currently charge in statute, which are not in regulation, and uh, to uh, make a couple of other non-substantive changes. Um, so the, the, the scope of this is pretty limited. Um, what I'd refer you to, uh, if, uh, if you have the packet open on page uh, 149, is just a memo which just details some of the possible changes to the text, and the text uh, begins uh, as part of the attachment on page 153 of your packet. I'll just um, highlight real quickly um, uh, the changes that we're proposing today. Um, we just want to, uh, throughout, the, um, throughout the entire section, we want to make changes, just uh, remove the word division uh, and replace it with board. Um, within article two, uh, you'll notice that we have proposed um, registration requirements uh, for the RDO application in 1399.20a, and then .220b is the requirements for the initial application for a CLD. Um, subsection C is the requirements for an initial application uh, for a spectacle lens dispensing registration, and subsection D sets out the requirements for an application for the non-resident uh, contact lens suspensor registration. Um, these, uh, all of these forms are, are on breeze as we only take online uh, applications for the registration. So this is basically putting everything that is asked on breeze into regulation. Um, it just makes us kind of completely um, whole with um, how we do things from a, from a regulatory point of view. Um, so we'll move on to uh, 1399.222 subsection A. Um, this section uh, just requests the information for a renewal, not for an initial application, but for a renewal. Um, subsection B uh, requests uh, the information for a renewal for a spectacle lens dispenser. Uh, subsection C uh, so, uh, request the same information for a um, CLD. The, the memo um, didn't quite get updated with that information. 
And then subsection D requests the same information for a renewal for the uh, non-resident uh, contact lens dispenser. Um, the last uh, changes that I would just highlight were would be uh, 1399.260. Uh, and 261, um, this just aligns our fees in regulation, which are currently uh, in statute, but the regulation has the fees that are incorrect. Um, the statute has the correct fees, so we're just sort of fixing uh, that little error. Um, and uh, the final thing I, would, I think I would highlight would be uh, .262. Um, which deletes the text uh, about offering refunds uh, as per Department of Consumer Affairs policy, we do not offer refunds anymore. Um, that's that's kind of the, the long and short of it. So I'm happy to take any questions or changes. Uh, this is Adam, I didn't have any feedback on that uh, bill. Um, bear with me. Uh, yeah, no, I didn't have anything. This is this is um, this is what we tried to do before. No. No, I think I think what you may be referring to was the statutory review. Um, we did actually there there was back in 2017. I know when the committee first started meeting, there was a uh, there was a proposed um, some some changes back in 2017. Uh, that was uh, a proposed regulatory package, but um, it did not really contain a lot of the information that was needed. Um, there was incorrect fee amounts, things like that. So this is this is a new regulatory package um, separate from that. That one was not. Right. So, so that was our attempt to update the fee and then this actually does it. Correct. Got it. Thank you. Anna, did you have any comments? Comments. Oh, comments or comment? Uh, awesome. Uh, okay, I, so I guess we'll get a motion to approve. Can I get a motion? And, and members, there is a there is a suggested motion on the um, memo itself. Um, if you if you'd like to refer to that, um, this would the motion would refer the would would refer the package to the full board for review and approval. Um, at a future meeting. So, if that's helpful. Yes, thank you. So, I'll move to uh, recommend to the full board that these uh, regulation changes, um, well, I'll just read it, made, uh, made to section 1399.200 through 1399.285 of the California Code of Regulations, based on the discussion of materials presented here today and direct staff and council to make any further changes prior to presentation to the full board. I'll, I'll modify that to make any um, uh, uh, conforming changes uh, prior to the presentation to the full board. Anna, would you like to second? Yes, I'll second. Okay, and then uh, we'll open it up to public to the public for any comments. If they're able to do any chat. This is the moderator. I will go ahead and open up the Q and A section. All right, the Q&A section is now open. And just a reminder to the public, if you raise your hand, we won't call on you. Um, we'd like you instead to uh, type. You would like to make a comment when we open the Q&A panel, and then we will unmute you in the item we receive your requests. And uh, we are displaying directions for how to do that. If you're not seeing the Q&A panel, Click on the icon of a person next to three lines at the bottom of your screen, and then you should see it to your right. We'll give you a few moments. All right, this is a moderator, and we have a Joe Neville that would like to make a comment. So, uh, Joe, I'll let you know when you're unmuted. 
All right, you've been unmuted. You have two minutes. Thank you very much. I just want to make sure you can hear me. I had trouble with this uh, at the full board meeting. I can hear you perfectly, Joe. Thank you, Adam. Uh, really, it's more of a question uh, in the proposed regs. In 1399.220A, with respect to the registered dispensing optician application, I note that in um, A6 under entity type, um, there's not a space for, for a general corporation, I'll call it. It says professional corporation, um, but I don't think any of uh, the retail companies that I'm aware of operate as professional corporations you know, who have to register as an RDO. So that seems like a new one, and I'm just wondering if there was an oversight or if there is something that we need to be educated on. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this is the moderator, and we have uh, no more requests for public comment. Okay. Shall I go ahead and close the Q&A panel? Yeah, that's fine. All right, I will do that. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'd just like to thank Mr. Neville for his comments and for his question. Um, we are making this clear within our regulations. Um, this is something that we came across and, and made a huge uh, outreach effort regarding towards the end of last year. Um, we were alerted that according to government or corporations code, um, health uh, services providers are required to be a professional corporation, um, that we had not been upholding that standard um, in order to ensure the uh, uh, opportunity for uh, patients who might have grievance to be adequately compensated um, in the case of a, a judgment in their favor. Um, and so Natalia worked with all of our registered dispensing optician um, businesses in order to um, help them through the corporate incorporation process and then um, re-register them with new numbers within our database so that those corporation uh, uh, changes would be no noted. Um, this is, as we said, a, a part of the corporation's code um, that we had not been enacting, but that we did last year make uh, clear to all of our registered dispensing optician businesses and worked um, quite diligently, Natalia worked diligently, uh, to make sure that all of our registrants came into compliance. Natalia, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I wanted to clear up what seems to be a misunderstanding is that um, what Char is speaking of specifically was the limited liability corporation uh, was the changes that we made uh, that we realized uh, when we were incorporating her. Um, per the regulation um, that Mr. Uh, was talking about, it does appear that S Corps and C Corps should have been allowed on the list and for some reason we're not there. Uh, so that will be adjusted and added. Um, Thank you, Mr. Neville, for bringing that up. Thank you for the answers. And um, Char, please, that we will uh, go ahead and vote with the committee. So we have had the motion. Um, I'll go ahead and add Bill. Sorry, I was muted. I okay. I just thought you were thinking really hard, Anna. Yeah, I made the motion. <laughs> yeah, all right. I'll second the motion. Oh, we're voting. Oh, I. <laughs> I as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, members, very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Natalia, as well. Uh, and then moving on, we'll uh, move on to section uh, item number eight, which will be the discussion and possible actions of petition statutes. Mm -hmm. um, and just in the interest of transparency, I, I did want to disclose that 
in the ordinary course of business, my employer, my employer has had occasion to uh, contact the National Association of Opticians and Optometrists as a consultant. So just by virtue of my being a business associate of this organization, I was privy to the advanced copy of the co comment letter the organization submitted on the agenda item. I was given the uh, opportunity to uh, comment, but I did not do so. Therefore, this uh, prior knowledge doesn't rise to the level of a conflict of interest that would require my abstention or recusal from consideration of this matter. Uh, so I just want to reiterate that I'm not a member of the organization and I took no part in the comments or writing of the letter. Uh, I will conduct a discussion and potential vote today only in the best interest of obviously California consumers and our registered dispensing opticians. Um, Mark and Natalia, if you'll please move to giving the staff report regarding the optician statutes. Definitely, and I'm taking this one since Mark got regulations. Uh, so, uh, uh, so this went to the full board at the last board meeting, and unfortunately, I lost my place. So I don't remember what exactly that was. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, this went to the full board last board meeting, and several board members had comments or questions, as well as the letter uh, that was previously mentioned by the, uh, from the NAOO. And we're going to go over each of those comments and or questions uh, section by section. Um, the first comment is by Dr. Kawaguchi um, for 2545B1. Uh, he supports raising the limit of fine to 5,000, but is concerned about the possible risk of contingency if the application of the fines over the years and ask it if it would make sense to include a base fine and use multipliers based on the number of violations or number of business locations. Staff notes that the fine levels can potentially be handled in regulation. So while this can be handled in regulation, I think that there's been significant discussion among the committee and the previous um, reviews of this um, proposed statute change. Um, and I think that it would do well to maybe consider the base and then those multipliers um, and would love to hear from the committee their thoughts on how that sort of structure could be implemented. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, oh, there it is. I couldn't pull up those dots. So the question is, um, and I don't know if we're rehashing this because I don't, it's kind of hard for, is the strike through and red line what we had originally done? Let me scroll down. The, so we're two four two five four five B one, right? Mm-hmm. Right. New so, new text is new text is underlined and high and uh, uh, struck through for for old text and right. And it's highlighted in yellow is is uh, is something that the board raised as a concern. So my question is, we had previously recommended the what's underlined and what strike through, right? Those are our suggestions. Correct. Okay. Yeah, well, this, so to Dr. Kawaguchi's point, I mean, whatever that, you know, if we're concerned about consistency of application, um, uh, what, is there a DCA policy on this? The idea of a fine and multiple, you know, multiples making it go up and so forth? I'm not aware of any policy, but that's something that we could, that's something we could definitely look into. 
Well, as legal counsel to the board, have you by chance had uh, opportunity to uh, review other practice acts that include such provisions? Um, I, I can't say as I sit here uh, that I'm aware of that, how that issue is handled across different practice acts. Uh, you know, this is something that would be adopted potentially by the legislature and amended in committees in both houses and stuff. So I would just remind us that this is just a proposal and it's not that we're really adopting these numbers right now. So they, even they may change quite a bit as we go through the process. I think it is important right. to recognize that there, this will go through the legislative process, but I think it also is important that our original text uh, represents the intents of the committee. Um, and then also too is legally defensible, but I think there is something to be said about the appearance that this is meant to hit large businesses um, as NAOO comments. Um, but looking at a base and then multipliers would in fact then make the C in large, in, in, in cases of large retailers, commiserate with the number of fines or the number of locations um, not in compliance. Because I would say my perspective was just looking uh, at this was that the fines are per, I guess, just to make sure I'm clear on this, uh, if let's say a larger corporation did, had a a violation, it would be for that one specific incident in that one specific location. Um, but whenever it's talking about multipliers, uh, it says based on the number of violations or number of business locations. I guess I'm trying to understand uh, how that relates to like when a business does violate something. Let's say that let's say like there's an optical store, one of 500 in California. That one optical store violates an article in here. Does that does that multiplier impact the corporation based on how many stores because of that one instance? Uh, Cherie and um, Alex might be a better answer to this, but um, I will do my best and they can add on to it. Um, when I, so if one specific store, let's say one manager made a choice, then that would affect only that one manager. Mm -hmm. But if it was a regional decision of, based on a number of stores and they all violated it, then that's when that multiplier would come in. Um, so if one specific store only did it, then that's just them, it's just that one fine but we're not going to then find all of the stores for yeah. what one specific store did. Yeah, I mean, I think it makes sense if it's based just on the violations that happened. Um, I, I think what the specifically what this is meant for was that since they have, since it's one company, they only get one fine and we're trying to prevent that. Uh, um, if, that makes if in sense. fact, there's a company-wide practice that we are trying to Come back. I think uh, Mr. Casella had his hand raised. Yeah. So my concern, and it might come up again and again, with kind of this whole exercise is this was our recommendation to the board, which would then recommend to the legislature, which would then make the sausage of legislation. Um, and so it's like really here, like what we were focusing on just getting the modern range for fines. Um, and yeah, there might be a bunch of other ways to do it. I don't, um, I don't disagree, but I don't know that, that, you know, are we being, like ask to change our recommendation, which will be then possibly changed as a recommendation from the board to the legislature. Since this is many steps kind of removed and like, um, you know, we can go through this process 17 times before the legislature 
votes on this. I know for a fact that when this is in committee, depending on what, what day of the week or month it is and how it relates to our meetings, there are going to be changes to legislation that we're not going to be able to comment on. Um, and so it's, I, it's a fine exercise, and I'm prepared to do it. But, um, you know, I think we made our recommendations, and uh, if, if people want to second-guess them, I think they're, they're free to, because I know they're going to be third-guessed by the legislature in any event. Um, I think the range of fines is appropriate that we've done. Um, yeah, if there's a system for multiplying or doing whatever, then um, I recommend the board consider that when they consider what they recommend to the legislature after being informed by what other um, whatever uh, body subject you know under um, DCA do. You know, because if we're going to do a novel, a novel fine approach, um, you know, great. Um, uh, enjoy your 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 testifying before the legislature, Adam, and explaining why we're doing what nobody else is doing. If that's the case, I don't know. Anyway, that's my two cents. But I like the way we had originally wrote it. And I think that that uh, you know I want to want to stress to the board or the committee that um, I believe, as I said, you know, from the very beginning, that this has gone under extensive review by staff and by committee, um, and it is completely valid to determine that your previous discussion and your determination should stand. Um, but I think that it also to I, I don't I think that if this committee is clear. To the board about what it's recommending we have discussion about the points that they've brought up I, I don't see that there would be a continued sort of ticky tack redlining of what the committee has suggested but i want to make sure that we are thinking about their comments and that the text that we're, we give to them to adopt is in fact representative of how the committee would like to approach it and if that is has been reflected by the previous discussion and by this text then I, by all means, suggest that the committee uh, move to other matters in which might need discussion. Yeah, so I think since we're the ones who aren't actually going to be levying the fine, um, our language is uh, fine, and whoever's actually issuing the fine can, can um, can use their reasonable judgment. It's a broad range, so. We would actually levy the fine. So those those are um, levied by our enforcement unit, approved by me, uh, and then sent to registrants. No, but it's not we the committee. It's we the board. Right? Yes, we the board. Yes, yes. And, and of course, of course, the discussion and the determinations you make here are suggestions to the board, but they yeah. often and uh, they realize that there is valid and very fruitful discussion from professionals within the uh, profession, from registrants within the profession during this committee. And I think when weighing whether or not that discussion has occurred, then I think that the board is likely to go along with what the committee has discussed and what the committee has determined as long as that discussion has been full for all committee members and the determination is a consensus of what will be sent to the board. And if that is where right. we are now, then, then of course. Right. My, my point is the board will approve your, your fine determination and if Glenn wants to multiply it by three because it's the third violation, that's the spot where he says, I don't think you were tough enough on these people. But as it stands out, we have the broad range, and um, I think anything else is tying hands. Anyway. So, do, so at this point, do we just need to 
say yes on the wording, no on the wording. Okay. I mean, from my standpoint, well, Shara, you're. Yes, that is correct. The committee has discussed the option, has discussed the comment, and has determined that their previous determination should stand. We can move to another port, another comment uh, within the document. And the previous determination is what has been crossed out, correct? No. So what is currently there, which I believe says uh, $250 to $50,000 per violation, or no more than $50,000 per violation, is what you guys decided on. Mm -hmm. um, and we are proposing to keep that or change it. And it sounds like you guys want to keep it. Yeah, that's, I would say keep it. Okay. Anna. Perfect. We'll move on to 2550.1C. NAO feels this definition does not make sense as written, suggests that certain acts be listed, but no such act is included. So just reverting to match 2550D. So uh, are there acts under fitting that our professional members feel should be included that was not originally included, or does this um, I, definition fit? I remember our original conversation was the separating fitting from adjusting, I think, Anna, like we were discussing, like, there's the adjustment portion, then the actual fitting of like the measurements. Um, I think we do mention measurements. Uh, so I think it is in there. And then, you know, section D right below it uh, talks more about like adjusting and like the uh, final fit and dispensing. So I felt good how it is. Well, Anna, if you have an opinion. I agree. I think it's good the way it is. And let me just jump in real quick. Both, both you, I, I work very extensively with both you and Anna on these definitions, this fit and fitting and adjust and adjusting. And I remember getting language back from Anna that, that really helped capture the separation that we're talking about. So we did, we, we did render this pretty thoroughly, I think. I would feel good. Not to <laughs> Mr. Chair. Uh, I just wondered today as we heard Dr. Linzer's presentation in those six areas, is there maybe benefit to going back to looking at those in more depth um, yeah. to perhaps include some of that in our language? So this is Bill. Um, it seems the comment was that it, the initial comment was that it doesn't make sense that we haven't listed certain items that we imply that we're going to list, but we have not provided those, that list. But in my reading of it, we do provide that list after the second comma, and that's designing taking measurements to determine size or shape uh, or uh, replacing. Yeah, and sorry. so I, I think we've done that, what the, the comment was concerned about. I think it's in there. I think they just, I don't know if there's a, if it's a, a, a sentence structure, but it seems to me that we do list the following acts beginning with the taking of measurements. Agreed. I think we, I think uh, where some of it can get a little gray, and I think Mark, we had talked about it, was that, and, and uh, like the actual, if you could break down measurements, yeah, there are certain measurements. Like, I mean, we could break this down into a, every single act, um, but I think this kind of encompasses that, and so without, having all of the uh, tasks list out, but I think it does, it, it captures it, like we, we do have measurements. Um, so my understanding is that uh, all the committee members uh, agree that this works as is and recommend no change. Yes. Moving on to 
550.1E. NAO suggests that the terms registered sensing optician and registered sensing and registered, registered optician are confusing and recommends the terms be removed from statute and replaced with definitions from the My only thought on the comment was, because we do have dispensing optician, registered dispensing optician, and a registrant, and I know that that, that is a lot in that first sentence. Um, is it possible just to say registrant? Because we're all, I mean, you're either a registered spectacle lens dispenser, registered CLD, registered non-lens dispenser. Right, um, so I, I think the attention to this is that the this program has been called the Registered Dispensing Optician Program since the 40s. Um, so this is what a lot of the licensing population knows themselves as. So this specifically is when and the program is still going to be called this with the regulation change. It's not changing. So when it's talking about this in the section, it's talking about all the licensees as a whole. Um, oh, so okay. it is yeah, it's not talking about like individual ones. It's talking about the program and all of its licenses as a whole. And Mark can correct me um, if that's incorrect. Okay, thanks. And is the is the implication that these these are um, these all mean the same thing? They're just alternatives that might be referred to in other contexts of the statute. Um, Sometimes the, the person's referred to as a registrant and sometimes they're a dispensing optician. Um, is that like part of the context here? Yeah, so this is just saying like these are, when we say dispensing optician, registered dispensing optician or registrant, we are talking about all our licensees as a whole. Uh, this is just, this is just our definition section that's just stating that. So, and I, I do agree with NAOO that this has been a confusing term in the past, um, and that's part of why we are trying to fix it here. Unfortunately, um, we are not changing the program name, um, but we are changing license types within it to make it more clear. I know it's a lot, but the titles are clear. You know, it is clear. Uh, I know yeah. it's a lot, but... But I would keep it as is. Agreed. Anna, did you have any comments? Um, I mean, I think it's clear. Uh, I think having to change it would be a lot. <laughs> All right. I will note as no change. Okay, um, same section, subsection 2550.1G. Uh, this was changed to remove confusion with unregistered assistants working under optometrists. It was brought up at the board that the way we were phrasing it before made it very confused with the um, optometric assistants we were talking about. So we changed the name to unregistered optician trainee to make it more clear that we are talking about trainees under opticians and not under optometrists. Uh, also, in this section, in in section three, Dr. Karaguchi does not feel subsection three and four are needed as it makes the statute more confusing. So um, I kind of get what he's saying. Um, these are these these look like they're essentially retail clerks or office clerks or somebody who's not really doing the fitting and adjusting sort of of thing and 
you know, in the context of the big retail establishments, you know, they may be hiring people, you know, that work the front desk that, uh, you know, that just retrieve your box and, and you know, hand it to you. I don't know. And I don't um, think it's confusing. Sorry, Bill. Yeah. But I don't find it confusing. I actually appreciate how detailed it is because I think there are a lot of other states where it's very unclear what an unregistered or unlicensed person is allowed to do. And I think there is like gray area. So I appreciate the how we can actually, you know, it really is detailed on like what this unregistered person is able to do. Um, unless unless it, it's confusing because it's like transaction sales really aren't like an office in duty. Um, <laughs> But um, but at the same time, like I appreciate how like detailed it is. So you know exactly what an unregistered person is not allowed to do. I, I guess that your point's well taken. That it, that this is actually not confusing as it relates to the unregistered optician training. They can do all of those things. Exactly. Um, but so I think. Um, uh, but you don't have to be an unregistered uh, optician trainee. You could be something less to do three and four, but yeah. there's no harm in saying um, we're not saying that if you do three or four, you must be considered an unregistered optician trainee. Yeah, I think it. Yeah, I, I think it's. I don't think it's confusing as to what the trainee can do. No, I appreciate the details, so I would leave it as is. Anna, how do you feel? Um, I agree. I think that having it listed is better than not because then some people may ask, well, can you give us an example? And these are pretty um, straightforward examples of what mm -hmm. you expect someone who's unregistered. Um, to do. All right, consensus for the committee members is recommending no change. Um, so moving on. To section 2555U. NAO feels this pr proposed section would be proposed, posing an unmeetable standard on an optician and feels an optician would not be trained to know when slash how to refer. The California Optometric Association recommends observation and place of examination. Staff recommends further discussion on this section for additional recording, rewordage, apologies. Yeah, I definitely take examination out of there because opticians aren't examining the eye. They're not licensed to do that. So I would agree. Um, and a lot of, and I mean, I would say all of the majority of opticians really aren't trained to identify like a disease or like any pathology. I'm wondering, though, Adam, uh, Mrs. Shara, in taking a look at prescription assessment, um, again, I'm going, going back to Dr. Lynch's description of the profession, mm -hmm. um, that maybe we need to uh, specify that if it's observation and prescription assessment, so there is an inability or an issue, um, and Anna, I, I would love your feedback on this. Um, an inability to fill the prescription due to some unaccounted for anomaly. Um, that if you have a patient who comes in with a prescription, you try to fill that prescription and realize that by chance something has been missed in the optometric uh, examination that isn't addressed by the glasses prescription that you're filling, or if it indeed aggravates a condition, that then there is a need to say this prescription is for a particular you know configuration of glasses 
but I'm really seeing that you aren't being treated for this and having trouble fitting these glasses to you because uh, there might be another condition that needs to be treated or another uh, anomaly that needs to be addressed. I would suggest that you go back to your optometrist and have them reevaluate you. Um, it may be this, but go back to your optician or your opt optometrist I'm sorry, or your optometrist, and please be sure that this is the most appropriate prescription for you. And, you know, if, if I'm not able to, um, you know, formulate glasses for you that keep you from feeling woozy, maybe this isn't the right prescription. And, and the intention is to refer back to the optometrist to clarify the prescription in order to make sure that what's being filled is going to best meet the patient's needs. Does that make sense or is that a... a, a, a a situation that either of our professional members have, have encountered? That would, I can only think of one actual instance um, of, but I, I just don't, I think this is such a rare thing to ever happen that I can only even think of one situation where an optician would be able to identify because like if someone had an eye turn, like their eye has a visible turn, um, but there's nothing on the prescription that might speak to that. Uh, but I just don't know if like the opticians, there there is enough training for opticians to really identify these issues. Um, and I'll let Anna speak. Um, so I'm just trying to uh, make sure, are we still talking in regards to the trainees or an actual person who's licensed? An actual optician. Well, in my situation, or in the past, I would say the only time that we referred back to an optometrist, um, usually I don't refer back to an optometrist. I would give them a call first just to verify because I've seen where a patient's brought in multiple prescriptions from the past years and then I've noticed like a really big change in the prescription itself and I would normally call the office just to verify to make sure that the prescription that was dispensed from the prescriber is correct um, just because I, I tend to look for consistency um, and I think another situation has been where a mother has brought in a child's prescription and the child's not there because they're in school and they want to use the PD from uh, what was on the prescription. And in those situations, that's kind of when I would refer um, towards calling the prescriber or the office and just asking them, you know, in the past, can we just make sure the PD is correct? Because usually we would want to measure the patient in person um, in terms of glasses and trying to see what else. Uh, I don't know. Uh, do you notice that, Adam? Uh, yeah, but I don't know if that falls under what this is speaking to. Um, because, like, if we were to observe something like in the case of... Yeah, I just, again, like, I just don't feel like opticians have the training um, for it to be, like, all-encompassing under, like, any pathology. Like, for it, I just feel like the opticians have the right training to be held to the standard. This is Bill. Yeah. Oh. Oh, go ahead. No, yes, please, Bill. Go right ahead. So... The examples that Anna used, which are good and, um, you know, thoughtful and professional, don't result from either an examination or observation of the eyes. Yeah. And that's what this statute says. That's from good deduction and looking at the records and whatever. If the patient says, oh, Starting um, uh, three days uh, three days ago, after I saw the optometrist, but three days three days ago, now all of a sudden I'm seeing these flashes. Um, that might be meaningful, but again, that's 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 
that's a, that's from a report from the from the patient. It's not from an observation of the of the eyes or an examination of the eyes. And my understanding was that that you know opticians wouldn't have the equipment to be you know looking into the eye to kind of make that um, determination. So. You know, I, I'm in a weird spot because I think it's like, ah, this is the sort of professional misconduct that you would be protecting the consumers from instead of some of the other things we care about. But in this case, it's like I don't know that a, that a regular um, a regular um, dispenser would really know. It's, it's a tough, it's a tough standard. Um, the you know in terms of of um, disciplining somebody's license for misconduct. Um, I don't know if somebody if I, if, you, if maybe you could see if somebody has a sty in their eye, but does that mean they have to refer them to back to the doctor? Um, I don't know. Because at the same time, I don't even think um, a lot of opticians might even be able to identify what that is. So I, I mean, my, my suggestion would be to take you out. I don't know if Anna or Bill. I mean, and I, I, have one other, I, have, I have one other question for staff, and that is, in the version I'm looking at, in the yellow highlight, it has the word observation. But in the comment, it seems that the COA was saying use observation instead of examination. And I don't see examination in that section. So was that change already made? Correct. We felt that that was an appropriate um, correction to make, so we did make that change. Got it. So maybe that should be double underlined. Um, uh, does staff have any suggestions on on language that we could, you know, what we're trying to say is unprofessional conduct here that might that might work. Um, I get that if we know if 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 a if a optician knows there's a problem that should be referred to the doctor, um, they should do it. And if they don't, that's problematic. But I don't know how we how we set that standard. Mm -hmm. I think I'm hearing from our professional members that the current state of the profession this would not be needable. I think there's also the need to discuss whether or not at some point it makes sense that that's needable. Um, that, 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 you know, we are not only to codify what the current situation is, but ask for people to strive for a better ideal. Um, but what I think I'm hearing right now is from our professional members is that there just, there isn't a way to educate. We don't have within our system a way to educate opticians so as to be able to make these any determination whatsoever, um, even if it's not an examination or an observation, that there there isn't the training. We don't require the training um, for folks to be able to meet this. Yes. But then maybe there is discussion further in the future of whether or not we begin to require the sort of training that does allow and should allow um, opticians to do something that we think is important to consumer protection. So there's this, there's this two splitting. Yeah. I'm going to be devil's advocate at all times. <laughs> I, mean, I, think, I think if every single one of our opticians in California could identify this, that would be amazing. We would have the best opticians in the U.S. But, but as far as current state, we're not going to be able to uphold to the standard. Um, we're not providing them or requiring them to obtain this education. So you, so I just don't see it as something that's attainable. Is 
is it is it legally too vague to say um uh Failure to <laughs> refer to an appropriate autometrist, et cetera, um, as appropriate or when conditions warrant. Um, Could removal of the word pathology and replace it with issue or something like that make actually, to your comment, Bill, make it a little bit more vague? I don't know. Rather than pathology, they, they have to detect the likelihood of a pathology that requires the attention. I mean, if, if my optician fits me with a set of glasses and all of a sudden I get a bad headache, that's not pathology. That's just my optician going, wow, you have a bad headache. You should probably go back to your optometrist. I, I mean, could yeah. that? Yeah, as I think about this, I think it's something we have to work on, but I don't know if it's, if we have it now. and. You know, quite frankly, it's it's inviting um, more liability on people not trained to do optometry or ophthalmology um, when probably an optometrist or ophthalmologist missed the issue the first time. And also with Anna's comment with uh, prescriptions, just noticing issues, possible issues with a prescription. The only thing I can think of rewording would be identifying or failure to refer based on possible issues with written prescription. That would be an attainable standard. But yeah, I think taking out pathology examination would be helpful and maybe just focus on prescription. Anna, do you, do you feel? Yeah, I I agree because I think now I'm thinking back to all the all my experience and the only time that I've ever had a patient who where I noticed something wrong with their eye was because they wore a contact lens that was really really old and it caused um, a blood vessel to pop and so at that point you know I referred them to their optometrist or um, and because they didn't know what to do and they came to us and now as opticians, that's not what we specialize in. Mm -hmm. I guess the only other problem we might run into, Anna, like it was great that you had history with the customer or a patient, but what if it was a new customer or patient and you had no history whatsoever and you're being held to that standard? Well, actually that was someone who was new. They weren't even a patient of ours. and. Um, cause it was before when I was at Walmart and it was just a person who was walking by and they just saw that, oh, wow, look, I didn't know you guys do glasses here. And then, um, they were asking about their eye and I was like, whoa. And I think this was like <laughs> three years in when I was still new. And I just told them, you know, I recommend going to your optometrist and, um, they came back later and they, they were like, oh my God, it's because I've been wearing this contact for two months and you know, things like that. But that's the only time I say that I've ever referred. So, so again, I think it's like, I think you is just not attainable currently. So, I mean, I, I would throw it, like, I, would, I would just strike it out. So I'm, I'm, I, I think we've got a fantastic tool from Dr. Linser. I continue to come back to this occupational analysis. Um, and I really do implore folks to take a look at page 55 of her um, report, not the PowerPoint, but the full report that she gave to us, um, which is the table of prescription assessments. And I'm just wondering if adapting language from T2, from task two, neutralize current eyewear to determine existing prescription. So the knowledge statements are knowledge of methods of identifying refractive errors in patient prescriptions or knowledge of interpreting lensometer findings. But then there's also task 11, which is refer patients to optometrists or ophthalmologists to obtain current prescriptions. And the knowledge statements in there are knowledge of, submit, knowledge of requirements for patients to have prescriptions before ordering spectacle lenses, knowledge of required elements of spectacle lens prescriptions, knowledge of patient medical conditions that should be monitored or evaluated by a medical professional. 
So maybe it's a failure to refer patients to optometrists or ophthalmologists to obtain current prescriptions. Maybe that's the language that we use, which makes it clear that it is simply about understanding that you know, medical conditions that should be uh, addressed by a medical or conditions that should be addressed by a medical professional, um, the elements of the prescription and the uh, requirements for uh, a valid prescription before ordering lunges. Those are things that are key to the optician occupational analysis as far as tasks and something that we should and do currently expect opticians to meet. And so maybe that's the language we're looking for is the failure to refer patients to optometrists ophthalm or ophthalmologists to obtain current prescriptions. And then knowing that within that, the knowledge statements that break that down are attainable by our current population and reasonable within the occupational analysis. I'm just thinking that it's what that would be protected by the expiration of a prescription, so I wouldn't be able to even utilize the prescription um, if it's an older prescription. But I think we're right, and we're that's the deal. We're asking opticians to know that that if it is an ex you cannot fill on an expired expired prescription. So I think these are things that are meetable. Yeah. And that sets a standard for. It doesn't leave out a standard for. Uh, a need to understand the conditions of your patients, but doesn't set the standard so high that it's not being met by our requirements or education or the training that we require of our licensees. So it doesn't address it completely, but it addresses it where we are now and doesn't leave us silent on something that we think might need to be addressed. Maybe it's a strategic plan item. Um, and <laughs> how we look at education and what sort of um, sort of education we should be asking opticians to obtain so that they're able to identify what might be important. I would agree with that. <laughs> I, I do. I agree with that. Is there a comment from Anna or Bill? If perhaps we look at changing that or failure to refer patients to optometrists or ophthalmologists to obtain current prescriptions. And within that, it's the knowledge statements of, uh, you know, a current prescription, the elements of the prescription, and then uh, medical conditions that might be, that should be monitored or evaluated by a medical professional. Those are our knowledge statements that we are currently have identified within the profession and that 16% of an optometrist's time is spent doing. I agree with that. I think that's something that's obtainable. Yeah, I think that makes sense. My only um, thing to iron out is current prescription. Is Does that mean, is that the same thing as an unexpired uh, prescription? Um, yeah. I don't know how long prescriptions are good for, um, but if I got one like four months ago and I go to the um, optician today, did that count as a current prescription? I would imagine, no? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But I've had, you know, individuals come in with like 15-year-old prescriptions. And yeah. That's a, that's a no. Um, Obvious no. <laughs> uh, that makes a lot of sense, and it's uh, refreshing that we're actually talking about um, the work that the professional is doing, and their um, um, their failures or ineptitudes relating to the actual practice as opposed to whether um, who they're having sex with or uh, that they got a DUI on a weekend. Um, this week today, we're actually talking about professional misconduct and standards that 
that the public really needs when getting care from these people as opposed to those other policy issues. Yes. Uh, let me make sure I understand numbers correctly. You're recommending uh, give it back to staff to reword to make it more applicable to the prescription, correct? Yes. Um, how close are we to just uh, pounding out that language right now? I thought we were pretty close and just okay. adding that. So my hunch is that we can end up moving this forward at the end of the day. Right. I think that we're, I'm just, I, um, I'll draw everyone's attention, staff and committee members included. Um, I'm pulling from table 15 of Dr. Glintzer's report. Um, it's page number 55. And this has the task for prescription assessment. I'm at task 11, which is refer patients to optometrists or ophthalmologists to obtain current prescriptions. Okay, so we would just replace, um, so it would be to refer a patient to an appropriate optometrist or physician and surgeon if an observation of the current prescription. No, I think we're just, we're simply using Failure to refer patients to optometrists or ophthalmologists to obtain current prescriptions. Failure to do that is uh, against the act. And actionable. Yeah. If you fill a 15 year old prescription, you have failed to get a current prescription, and that is actionable within the act. And so, in the current language, act. after surgeon, where it starts with if, you would delete that and you would just put um, obtain current prescription. Noted. Okay, the next comment is 2559.15. Several state stakeholders have expressed concerns with this removal. CAOO notes that this section has existed for decades and feels no harm has been identified. Dr. Kogushi feels three to one ratio is unnecessary. Just six to one. The AOO also poses this change. This is the um, three on assisted trainees to one optician. I, I know we talked about this extensively before, uh, but there has been some questions And I think we have um, some comments within the staff memo that speak directly to the discussion that's occurred before. I just want to make sure that we address those now. I'm going back to look those. So I would say from. Will you remind me? Oh, I'm sorry. Will, will you remind me what section we're in, so they can five, reference five, the nine. correct? It's 187. Five, five. Page 187. Oh, I missed. Yeah, it's two five five nine point one five. Okay, so oh, within the staff memo, you'll see in in past DOC discussion, committee members reference the ABO and CLE requirements for continuing education. Reference that no, that's not it, that's not the correct one. Those are the only comments on two seconds. No, oh, I apologize, that's the year that's not the ratio. So I know that previously we had to talk about one register and a register are on site at all times, like that's why it marks out for absences of illness or vacation, that if the professional's not there, 
we want a professional there. But as far as like supervision, I know there's like three to one, six to one, but I know that there are two different perspectives. It's either you limit it, most states are either two to three or just as long as there's a licensed or registered professional in the business, then everyone in the business is under the supervision of that one individual. Um, I know like in my opinion, like I, I, I like the idea of having that physical presence that there should be a registered person on site at all times. Um, but choosing a number, I don't, I don't see us at, at to a point where we would need to regulate three at a time, six at a time. I think just as long as there's one, just as long as there's a registered person present on site would be my opinion. Uh, that makes sense. If you, if you think about um, the even the even broader powers that an optometric assistant has, who are supposedly working under the direct supervision of the optometrist, you know, there, there. Uh, as far as I know, there's no limit on the number of assistants who um, who are doing work in the office or on the premises. Um, and, you know, it gets, a, by having the, the standard that Adam suggests, it gets around that, um, the kind of the burden of determining that other number, like, did they send the kid out the back door so there were only uh, three people in the office, or was it technically four, or, you know, potential cat, cat and mouse games on that. Um, so I, 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 I get that point of, you know, as long as they're under the supervision, as long as there's one, one licensee there, um, then, uh, we're comfortable. And if that means you have to call in a sub because you're going on vacation, then you call in a sub. Um, but the preference is still to have somebody there, but we're not gonna not going to to get into the weeds on that number. I think I just want to remind the committee that there have been great discussions previously about what supervision could really look like, how much one registered optician could help an individual without education or training to perform their duties. Um, and I think that that's why we settled upon the three to one number, and perhaps we're looking at, um, you know, extending that ratio. Um, but I recall that there was extensive discussion about what's really needed to supervise someone who is not educated or have has experience in opticianry um, to make sure that they're doing what is right for patients. And so I just want to recall, want folks to recall that earlier discussion and maybe think um, a little more about kind of what we really want, what we really want supervision to look like. And, and I would like to build on that, Shara. We pulled the three to one number from our own statute. It came from the contact lens dispenser, um, and we just added that to the specific lens dispenser. Uh, that was the number that was already there. We were just making sure that it covered both the license types. Yeah, I think that's a that's a fair point. Of again, get get back to our original assignment. This is our recommendation to the board who's going to make a recommendation to the legislature and let the giant retail companies that want six to one or unlimited or whatever, let them do their lobbying there. And then that, cause that number is probably going to change. I think, I think as a public policy matter, Adam, I think you're hundred percent right that that's what it's going to turn out to be. Um, <laughs> Uh, in the when the when the process is finished, um, but yeah, w like we went through this and we thought it, it, it's about an unregistered trainee there, and it's like yeah, this is our recommendation, and uh, if people want to disagree with us, that's fine. Um, I think something to think about with like that. Still applicable to everybody. It still works. The person, which actually got a license to do a transaction. There are just restricted acts that are being um, taken into account here. So only three people under an optician can do optician duties. 
but you could still have three additional staff doing like clerical rooms. Exactly. So I, I agree that it can still work. It's just so I just take back everything I said. <laughs> so I, I agree with that. But there's a three to one ratio if I if I'm teaching and they're doing opticians like if they're I don't know troubleshooting an issue with a customer I would love to be there with them. Um, but then again, they you know un, un other individuals transactions. That, that, so I, I still feel like there's yeah. Some, yeah, if you read the sentence, it's like, well, how many on campus, in the store or wherever, how many of the unregistered trainees are um, fitting or adjusting spectacle lenses at that time? And it's, it, it, you know, three to one doesn't seem crazy in that context. Now, there might be six or 12 on site, but they're doing something other than fitting or adjusting spectacle lenses. And, I, and I'm actually kind of curious, based on like your experience with other retailers, because um, I know sometimes there might just be one registered person on site, but within the staffing size and how the store operates, do you typically see retailers having everyone do all optician duties or only certain individuals do optician duties in the business? Sure. Anna, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so I've worked in environments where we have a minimum of three unregistered um, trainees, and I've worked in environments where there's almost 40. And in the environments where there's 40, there was only two licensed opticians. And um, I can tell you how bad the redo rates were just because um, – <laughs> You can't catch them all, and I've tried, and um, like I have had to sit in a situation with a patient where they have someone who's still learning, and um, it's not their fault, and we have to do what's best for that patient. And what it comes down to is if you don't have, you know, one person can only do so much, and, you know, you have to think about what's in the best interest of that patient and their safety. Um, God forbid someone's not on site, then what if that prescription got dispensed incorrectly? Which I think in the past I've mentioned a situation where that had happened, where um, the measurements were completely off and, you know, the, the person who was not licensed, they wanted to just send that patient off. And imagine if that person got in a vehicle and they did not know, you know, what to expect for first-time progressive wearers, and um, they're not able to explain it to a, a patient the same way someone who's trained and licensed um, is able to do. And I understand how it can be frustrating with the whole overseeing, um, limiting it to just three, um, but at the same time, if you are in that professional shoes, can you do a really good job at making sure that the person who's learning from you feels comfortable? Um, or are you going to kind of jump around, which is what I've had to do, where I can only spend two minutes with each person. And that means that I can create more mistakes too. And that's not in the best interest of the patient, nor is it in the best interest of the business, because you're going to cost your business more money because of the mistakes. Um, so for me, I like to look at the bigger picture. Um, but that's just my feedback. So I would say keep it as is. Do you agree, Anna? How do you feel? Um, I think three to one is reasonable. And we should be encouraging people to get licensed and trained. And um, I've never met a person who said they didn't want to be. So.
Okay. Consensus is to keep 2559.15 as is, correct? Yes. On to 2559.2. Uh, past DOC discussion committee members referenced the ABO and, and NCLE requirements for continuing education every three years. Um, also referenced were the 18 other states that require opticians to maintain ABO and CLE certification throughout the, the issue of their state license. Uh, Dr. Kawaguchi, Kawaguchi disagrees with this change. NAOO also opposes feeling that the change is being made without evidence or need. Yeah, I think if we don't require the ABO to be current, then I don't see where, because I see that the three-year mirrors the ABO, but we don't require it to stay current. Um, so whether you're three-year or five-year, it's still going to expire. So I don't, so I, I, mean, I, I So I just want to want folks to recall that this is the period of time when um, a registrant is not practicing. So if you have a registration, you stop practicing, and what we now allow is five years to lapse, but you have passed the ABO, C ABO and CLE at some point, which may have been 15 years ago. You haven't been practicing for five years, but we are going to reissue your license without ensuring that you haven't occurred, that knowledge loss hasn't occurred, or that there hasn't been such a change in the profession since the time at which you took the ABO and CLE that there might be a gap in knowledge simply from what you were measured upon. I, and just to point out that right now, this doesn't prevent people um, from taking, uh, from you don't always have to take the exam when this lapses. If they've been keeping up their certification already on their own, I accept that as valid um, proof that you have been keeping up in your profession. You don't have to be retake, retake the test after those five years. If you've been working in another state, you don't have to retake those tests. You just need to provide me information that you have passed the state, uh, that you've been working in another state. If you've been working as an unlicensed person, I just need proof of employment within those past five years. So there are other ways for them not to always have to take the exam. Um, I just need proof that they've been active in the profession within those five years. Um, if they haven't, then they need to retake the ABO exam or the NCLE exam. Um, because that is a huge chunk of time to not be studying your profession. Uh, and we chose three years to match optometry, which is when you have to retake the California laws and rights exam. Uh, that's when you have to retake it if your uh, license has been delinquent for any length of time and eventually canceled. So I'm hearing that we may need to adjust this language um, that it's if an applicant for renewal has not engaged in full time or substantial practice, maintained their ABO and CLE certification or maintained registration in another state, that in fact we want to validate those instances as well. If you haven't done any of those things at the lapse of either three or five years, um, the board may require you to take the examination again. Right. With all those other other ways to satisfy it, it seems that in practice we're totally reasonable about it, and um, the three years doesn't seem so um, so harsh, um, and the, the, you know, kind of codifying that. Um, 
uh, in the statute, you know, might get, might make it more palatable to those who who object, um, and that that we could just add those um, uh, as the um, executive officer pointed out. We could just add those and see if that um, calms down the people concerned, but it wouldn't change our position um, and practice um, that if an applicant is not renewed um, or has not engaged in the full-time or substantial part-time practice of fitting and adjusting spectacle lenses, including practicing in another state, like all, whatever those li that list is, um, you know, we could just kind of do separate that out, comma, including, and then add those other things. Um, and then put a comma, and then within the last um, three years, then you have to take the examination again. Definitely, that could be better. Yeah, I agree. Were there any other comments on this section? No. Okay, so same section 2559.2E. Staff proposes changes to E based on NAOO's comments that original phrasing and licensed ophthalmist or ophthalmology association was confusing. So it is just a rephrasing of what we have written. And this was just allowing somebody who works for an ophthalmist or ophthalmologist to have a registration and to practice unsupervised. Okay. There are no comments. We move on to 2564.5. NAOO opposes the new requirement feeling the cost to be prohibitive. They note that the CDC guidelines only require cold water is sufficient. And this was the hand washing facilities uh, that we had discussed. In this age of coronavirus, um, I think we just want to want to uh, verify that that is the CDC guideline. But I think that if the CDC is comfortable with cold water, um, disinfectant soap, and adequate drying devices, um, that that would be acceptable here in our statute. Yeah. I do, um... I don't know in California that um, what the CDC is going to say um, uh, a month from now uh, when their entire staff is replaced at the whim of their appointing authority. So I think um, if our experts think hot water is required, then um, it may be a little extra of what the CDC requires. Um, It seems like common sense to me um, that we require hot and cold running water. Um, I guess the question is, is like, what what clinical setting that isn't going to have um, hot water? I guess maybe in some in, in retail spaces, maybe they don't have um, hot water in their little sinks or something. I don't know, but. I think we, maybe it's possible just, I, I think the question really is, is does hot water really aid in sanitation significantly more than cold water does? Um, so, I, I, you know, maybe if we can, as staff, go back and check the CDC guideline or if, um, Staff who's not currently presenting could maybe take a look and see if we can find some information. Um, yeah, I think that I think that that's a good idea, and I also request that staff ask 
the California Department of Health or whomever the equivalent is, what their opinion is on it. Excellent, yes. But again, I'm comfortable with our recommendation as we originally made it. If the science is otherwise, then it makes sense that it gets changed along the way. This is Mark. I'm looking at the, the CDC guidelines on hand washing right now, and it just simply says here, wash your hand, wet your hands with clean running water, warm or cold, turn off the tap, apply soap, and then rub for, do it for 20 seconds, et cetera. Rinse your hands under clean running water. So it says clean running water, warm or cold. Okay, did we have any other reason for water other than hand washing? If that's it, then we could just say with running water. Yeah, I agree. Okay. All right. Yeah. If there are no further comments. Uh, 2564.70, NAOO opposes expansion of online contact lens seller registration to include online sellers of any prescription devices, including eyeglasses. They ask where the demonstrated need for expansion into eyeglasses and know only one other state that has imposed such a requirement. Um, and I would like to point out when we originally discussed including spectacle lenses, um, I was the one who brought up that this has been requested uh, to staff, um, specifically businesses have asked what registration they need to apply for if they are out of state and they sell spectacle lenses uh, to California residents. So uh, staff identified the need and brought it before the committee. I believe also to um, Chara here, um, our previous discussion has included the sort of recognition that this practice occurs now without any regulation, um, that it's not as though silence on uh, a registration for spectacle lens dispensers means that uh, folks are not providing this service to California residents, but simply they are providing it without any oversight by our organization. Are there any comments uh, for this section, or are we leaving it as is? I'm in between. <laughs> I've been thinking about this one. Uh, but I would say, I mean, leave it as is, in my opinion. Um, and are there any? I'm guessing there are a lot of other examples. I'm just trying to think of any other medical devices that are shipped via like interstate commerce, like is there, are there any other example of medical, I mean, I guess we have contacts, that's. Yeah, we did look thing. into, contacts are some of like the easiest and smallest things to ship. Um, other devices would be more expensive. So the closest thing I could probably think of is hearing aids um, might be considered. Um, that's definitely something staff can look into. I'm just trying to think uh, like, if, yeah, if that's. We could also look into other pharmaceuticals and see what those are like for out-of-state people who mail prescriptions. 
um, are you able to also look at like CPAP machines that require a prescription as well? We could definitely look at that and see if we can find some information on it. Because I'm just thinking, because it is, I mean, I understand, I completely understand why we're like, this is traffic into California. Um, but it's not, but if it's not like a business based in California. We already license businesses who are in California. This is, we're just including it to include a different kind of prescription. Okay. So they already have an, the non-resident contact that what it is right now, and we're proposing to change it to include both contacts and So companies that are outside of California shipping their products to California consumers. I would be okay leaving it as is. Are there any other comments from the committee members? Nope. All right, uh, moving on to section, oh wait, Anna, did you have a comment? I think when we made the decision to do the expansion, it was mainly because like online businesses have started to boom and um, there was a lot of even out of the country shipping, especially the like Etsy stores, Shopify, Amazon and everything. Um, I think that was the whole point was because, you know, if they're not being regulated, then you have to think about the harm that it can do, especially if they ship something that's counterfeit and things like that, which happens often. Um, I mean, I've seen pack, uh, contacts get repackaged and, you know, you have to think about those things. Definitely. Uh, consensus from the committee is to leave it as is, um, so we will move on. Uh, section 2564.74, NAOO suggests it is it be the company's designated sig signatory as opposed to the specific officers. Staff rejects the suggestion. Um, also in the same section, uh, NAOO asked what registration number does this refer to? How can the company have a registration number if they are just making applications? Staff proposes adding if applicable for clarity. That makes sense. Is there an um, explanation on the rejections by the staff for the changes from president or secretary? So it, it's become the problem where the designee would sign for it uh, when they're not responsible for the company. That would be a, an officer. Um, so I believe that's why we rejected it and Mark can hop in um, if he has more information on that. Uh, but we don't believe that the designated signatory has the authority to do so. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think the intention of this change was just to, the the change of requiring a president or secretary of a corporation was just to um, make sure that the people that are kind of making the decisions uh, that are doing these things are accountable if they're out of state. Kind of speaking to Anna's comments earlier about people out of state in this whole market expanding, we just want to make sure that the people that are selling these things in California, selling these lenses and spectacles are accountable and it can't just be shuffled off to kind of a, a, a shell company or something like that. I mean, it, it, you know, especially in the electronic age with email and everything like that and fax machines, what, <laughs> um, it, it's probably not horribly difficult to have the president or secretary sign something, um, in my opinion. So I, I think that was our, that's the reason behind it. OK, 
Okay, if there is no further comment from committee members, uh, we will go with uh, staff recommendation for this section. Okay, um, moving on to the next section, which is 2564.74C. NAOO suggests limiting this requirement to California. Staff requests further dis DOC discussion on this comment. And I believe this was the requirement we added for all advertisements from our online companies to list the registration number on their website or other advertising information they have. Doesn't bother me. Seems like we just that's what California requires in the advertising. Um, it's probably similar with other professions professions within the state, I'm guessing. I just want to be um, thoughtful about the widespread of websites, electronic communications, um, that those things may be intended for an audience outside of California, but we know how things go viral and spread. And so uh, advertisements that are supposedly meant for other regions um, may, of course, be um, accessed by California residents. Um, just the, just the, the, the virability of, of electronic communications. Yeah, it's it's a modern world, and uh, like if you watch TV, sometimes you see these commercials for law firms that are really fishing for giant class action lawsuits. And usually at the end of it, or there would be something on the screen that will say that it's actually a New York law firm or uh, whatever jurisdiction they're in. But they run their commercial all across the country you know, to try and drum up business. Um, if you, sometimes you'll see, you know, in a sweepstakes or something on the back of the form or a charitable contribution on the back of a form, it might have special instructions if you're in, you know, New York, Kentucky, or Indiana, there's an additional disclosure they have to make. Um, I, It doesn't seem too challenging to put on the bottom of your advertisement that you know your um, your license number, just like they do on real estate advertisements and things like that, broker numbers and things like that. And for like, if it's like an so we're talking about like the RDO number, the registration number would be the RDO number, correct? Yeah, for this one, it's talking about specifically the non-resident. Um, dispensing number. Oh, so okay. this would be our online company specifically. They would have to use the registration number on the website as well as any other advertising options they have for their consumers. Yeah, how would the consumer know to complain to us about their practices if that wasn't listed on, you know, just some website or you know, with the far reach of technology, how would how would people know people who've been wronged know to to file a complaint with the with the California agency, thinking they're dealing with some Indiana company? And um, with the AOO's comment with uh, limiting limiting this requirement to California, what would that I'm just trying to understand what would that look like if it was just California and what it was and what is that? So I'm assuming that when they speak to that, they're talking about limiting only adding this registration number to their advertisements in California. Yeah. Uh, what's wrong with that is the SHARA 
just mentioned is that if there is an advertisement in Nevada, well, that's not too far from California, there's a good chance it's going to make its way over here. But I think even more, I think Bill's given, given us really clear uh, instances of other professions where this is required uh, by particular states and where it's not an onerous um, requirement for national campaign ads or electronic advertising. I don't really have a further any further comment. Um, if there is no further comment by the committee, it sounds like we are leaving the statute as is. Um, so we will move on to the next one. So, so one thing like this may you know put the issue to rest so that you know, it doesn't get changed in a way that further hurts the consumer, maybe we could say, see, uh, advertising, um, uh, advertising, uh, I don't know if you say within California or that reaches California or intended to reach customers in California, including mail and all that other stuff must contain the following. So again, if you have a light, you're from, you're from Arizona, you have a license to do it in California, to send to California, but for this particular advertising campaign, it's just targeted for Arizona and New Mexico, you wouldn't have to include your California number on that. I think it's implied, but I'm just, that's just the belt and suspenders way of addressing it. That's something that can be added if the committee desires. I'm as is. Anna, do you have any comments, or are you okay with it as is? Fine with it as is. Okay. Uh, moving on to section 2564.76, section 2. Dr. Kawaguchi feels federal laws may be too lenient and create a loophole. Current federal subscription rules as set out here. This is talking about the uh, eight-hour business hours and uh, the receipt of a prescription online. I think our last conversation, we just said we would just match whatever the federal guidelines were, which I'm still fine with. In terms of the committee is it should stay as it is. Uh, on to subsection C. Uh, Dr. McIntyre feels this text could be misinterpreted to mean that a color of a package lens could be altered by a dispenser. Staff recommends the removal of this. Are there any committee member comments on this section? No. Okay. Going to staff recommendations for that subsection. Uh, on to the next subsection, 2564.80. Same concerns set out in 2545. Um, this is regarding the fee increase again to $50,000. I believe we previously left the previous section as is. Yeah. Okay. Um, for 
Article 3.5, Registered Sensing Ophthalmic Business. The NAOO recommends that these sections be moved back to the beginning in the, of the outpatient section in the 255 area. They feel this provided needed basic information to applicants and registrants to provide more logical flow. The legal counsel has initially reviewed this change and did not feel the creation of this new article was inappropriate. Um, if many members recall, the reason we created this subsection is because we had a license type within the general uh, section of the act, and it was very confusing to applicants. It was confusing to staff, uh, and it was confusing to the general public. Uh, and it was pulled out as a separate license type uh, to better understand uh, what applied to what license type and what applied to all licenses. I have no comment. Okay. Um, if there are no comments, we will move on, leaving it as is. Uh, subsection C for Article 2568.2. Uh, NAOO suggests adding in limited liability companies back into these sections. Staff rejects this change as the Attorney General's Office has determined the optical companies must be professional corporations as defined by Corporation Code Section 13401. And I should add, note that it was never in to begin with. And LLCs were never in the statute. Um, it was an error. They should never have been allowed to apply for registration. It was a clerical oversight that we inherited from the medical board um, that likely was you know, a slip by one individual person. And then if you see LCC, LLCs are accepted, they continue to accept them and then hand it down to us that underground reg or or, or you know non uh, compliance with statute um so we feel comfortable with uh rejecting that submission and uh continuing with the attorney general's uh, requirements i think that brings us to an end of our document oh it's it's bill i have one follow-up question going back up uh, around three comments ago dealing with the color. This would be in 256476-2C. Um, yes. Um, I'm just not sure I understand and am wondering if like what we had before the the new strike through would say, oh, a dispenser can't change the color of the lens. Like they couldn't honor the prescription, but on their own change the coloring. Um, and then we got rid of that uh, just yeah. now. And my question is, is this the same subject matter of the like fake the plano contact lenses where people just change color or put in the whatever the goofy thing is because it seems to me I like I'd rather have somebody going to an RDO with a real or to a uh, contact lens dispenser with a real prescription and getting their blue eyes or their cat eyes or whatever they're putting in based on a real prescription than going to the novelty store and just buying um, dangerous ones off the shelf instead of going back to the optometrist to get a prescription to get the decorative ones. Is my concern misplaced? Uh, so, from what I understand, what this does is this implies that a manufacturer can change the color of a manufactured lens when that's not possible. They are just selling those lenses. It already comes in that color. 
or lack of color. Um, so I believe Dr. McIntyre's intent was to remove that because there's no way for the uh, contact lens seller uh, to change that color. So that's just so the so it's really about packaging and how it comes into the shop. Yes. Okay, well then my concerns misplaced. Moving on. Okay. Uh, were there any other committee member comments on any of these sections we have discussed? No. Okay. Uh, that is the end of our um, recommendations from the board and stakeholders. Um, and then are we to the point where we can obtain a motion on this? Will, are you still here? Yes, I'm still here. I think uh, it would be helpful to make a motion just to recap um, the proposed changes that you actually are, are voting to adopt so that it's clear for the record and for in your minds as you're considering your vote and for the public as well. Okay. I was only to make a motion. So to review the changes that I have listed, um, 2555U uh, would be to edit the statute section to, in, to replace uh, pathology and examination with valid prescriptions. Um, 2559.2 be to add out of state registration, employment, and uh, current ABO certification. Um, and all others are changed as is. There are no changes. Those are the only two additions. Great. So someone could make a, a motion to approve the um, changes to the optician statutes as amended here today. Someone can just say so moved. I, I, this is Bill. I, I move that the uh, full board, um, that we recommend to the full board approving the changes to uh, the proposed statute as uh, we've discussed today, including any for little corrections that staff has to make to conform uh, to what we discussed. Okay, in a second. I'll second. Okay, and then we'll open it up to public comment. This is the moderator. I will go ahead and open up the Q&A panel. All right, the Q&A panel is now open. We're displaying instruction on how to access it. If you'd like to make a public comment, please type. I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists. I will unmute people in the order that they submit their requests for comments, and we'll give you a few minutes to do that. It appears that Mr. Neville has his hand raised. Um, if he could possibly unraise hand and use the chat function if he's indeed looking to make comment about this item. This is the moderator and he has submitted a request for that. So I will go ahead and unmute, unmute him. Uh, Joe, you have been unmuted. You have two minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, there's, there's not enough time to obviously go into a lot of the different issues that we raised in the discussion. I very much appreciate the discussion and have a better understanding where the committee is coming from. Um, we will follow up with the committee and or the full board and no doubt uh, take uh, Bill's suggestion of talking to legislators. <laughs> um, the point being that it's gonna be an ongoing discussion, I think. I, the, the only point I think, just because it probably came at the end, was about the limited liability companies. Um, I'd like to follow up on that one later. We've seen a um, uh, Attorney General Lockyer opinion that seems to disagree with the approach the board is taking on this. And while I will uh, digest it more thoroughly, I just wonder if in light of the fact that a registered dispensing optician 
a registered dispensing optician business is not engaged in a learned profession, um, does not require any particular education uh, or other criteria other than filling out a form um, to, to get the registration for the RDO, uh, if, if maybe um, we're not missing an opportunity. Um, we made our suggestion because of highlighted language in the board's letter to uh, people that registered as LLCs that uh, the legislature could make a change on that. So uh, we will follow up on that. Um, and again, thank you very much for the discussion today. Thank you, Joe. And Joe, uh, just to say staff would welcome discussions before the next meet committee meeting or board meeting. Um, we would certainly love to be able to uh, in-depth review the letter from Attorney General Lockyer and discuss any of the other um, potential changes that you would still recommend. See if there's an opportunity for us as staff to um, research and find uh, justifications for what might be um, uh, re requested. This is the moderator, and uh, just a reminder to put your hand down. You simply click on the hand raised hand icon a second time, and that will lower your hand. At this time, we have no other requests for public comments. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. All right, thank you. All right, so going on to agenda number nine, we have review discussion and possible action on the strategic plan. We still need to take the vote. Oh, I'm so sorry. I felt that good. Okay. <laughs> um, look at Anna. <laughs> I didn't hear you. Hello? Hi, I can hear you. Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't hear you. I didn't hear the vote. Oh, aye. Thanks, Bill. Aye. And I'm I as well. Okay, um, so next we had agenda item number nine, review discussion and possible actions on optometry strategic plan. And now our facilitator for today will present regarding the, optom the optometry strategic plan, um, Ms. St. Clair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm just going to go over a truly brief um, overview of the strategic planning process, which the board has begun. So uh, just a little, a quick, um, background, the Department of Finance, when they do an audit of a board or bureau, they require that that board have a strategic plan. So because of that, the Department of Consumer Affairs requires the boards to have a strategic plan. The boards uh, then reach out to solid planning, for which I work, and we represent uh, an objective third party. Um, we help with team building, uh, we organize the efforts of the strategic plan and we help the, the boards accomplish success through drafting a strategic plan as well as following that with action planning. So when we do a strategic plan, we look at uh, where the board is currently. So we look at the mission statement, which describes the board's purpose. We look at the values, which describe how the board achieves its purpose. And then we do an analysis of the work environment, both inside and outside the bureau. Uh, we look at how they envision the future, where they want to, uh, want to be in the years to come. And then uh, based on the goals that they select and each board selects its own goal areas. Uh, for optometry, they have six licensing, examination, law and regulation, enforcement, outreach, and organizational effectiveness. So we guide uh, the board and its staff in um, creating objectives for those areas. Here is a flowchart of the strategic planning process. And as you can see, the arrow points to where the Board of Optometry currently is in the strategic planning process. We are uh, currently working on the environmental scan. So uh, at the beginning of June, an uh, anonymous survey was sent out to stakeholders as well as staff. As of this morning, 559 people have responded to the stakeholder survey and five staff have uh, responded to the uh, staff survey. Again, 
uh, responses are anonymous. Uh, we have also started interviewing both board and committee members, and we'll be uh, doing interviews in per uh, well, actually, we'll be teleconference interviews with the board management as well. Um, once these, um, we will be finished with this process at the end of June, actually first week of July, at which time we will compile the results into an environmental scan report, which will be given to the participants of the strategic planning session one to two weeks before that happens. And so that strategic planning uh, process is scheduled for August 13th. When we do the environmental analysis, we are looking at strengths and weaknesses, which are inside the board. So a strength, as an example, would be um, the board is able to do a lot with a very small staff. And of course, we want to build on those strengths. A weakness could be that the staff is pretty small. So that could be a weakness. And of course, you want to mitigate or reduce weaknesses. And oppor so opportunities and threats exist outside the board. So the world outside the board, we take a look at that, should, what should be included in the strategic plan. So an example of an opportunity could be the increased participation of public members of the public in board meetings when they're done online. That could be an opportunity to explore. A threat could be, you know, um, how do you deliver optometry services in the midst of a pandemic? that could represent a threat to look at. So that is the SWOT analysis that the environmental scan, um, all the questions in the environmental scan center on SWOT analysis. And then finally, back in March, uh, one of my coworkers, uh, Suzanne Mays, had the board do a survey looking back at the previous strategic plan and just seeing uh, what the success was in terms of completing it. So um, you had nine objectives that were either 80 to 100% complete. You had uh, 16 objectives that were 60 to 79%. And then um, in the red category, zero to 59%, um, you had about 18 objectives in that category. And I'd like to comment that for those 18 objectives in the red category, of those eight of them, actually contained uh, action words such as review, consider, research, explore. And from a strategic planning standpoint, if any work is done, when the action uh, word is like review or research, any action done makes that objective complete. Because how do you register, how do you measure research? It's like some research has been done, so Basically, that objective has been met. And I, I mentioned that for two reasons. Um, the first reason is so that the board's not too hard on itself. The second reason is to encourage um, board members and staff, when they go forward with the new strategic plan, to pick uh, stronger verbs when um, crafting their uh, objectives for the strategic plan. And to that end, we have an objectives worksheet which has been sent to board members. We will send that same sheet again when we send out the environmental scan report one to two weeks before the strategic planning session. And on the, the last page of that worksheet is a whole page of action verbs to choose from when crafting objectives. So that is what I want to cover today. Did any, do any uh, committee members or staff have questions? So I just wanted to um, note to the folks who are participating today, if you um, have not done so, the link for our survey is on the Optometry Board website. Um, please take that survey to help us improve. I'm so excited to hear that we have had so many stakeholders, though, participate so far, um, and we'll encourage staff to do the same. Um, and then just want to make sure that the committee realizes that um, there was consideration in the last strategic plan, and you have on page 214, um, a, beginning on 214 and extending to 217, to um, objectives from the last strategic plan that in, did involve 
the dispensing optician committee. Um, but this year in developing our, our strategic plan, we really wanted to make sure that it wasn't just a matter of the board developing objectives that might be um, followed out or continued by the dispensing optician committee, so that the committee really had an opportunity to reflect on the work that it's done and um, to then develop specific uh, objectives for the DOC and for staff in helping them to um, really fulfill the mandates within statute of reviewing our statutes, reviewing our regulations, and creating a better practice um, for uh, protection of consumers in California. So I also want to just make sure that you um, take a look at the list that we've compiled of dispensing optician committee accomplishments. Um, this is from 2019 to 2020, so essentially under the um, new management team and new staff. Um, these are the things that we've worked on and accomplished for you, um, and I think that they're a great starting place for um, what we will look for as this committee um, suggests objectives and, and goals for the coming years. Thanks, and then, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, this is uh, Trisha. I was just going to say, are there any other comments or questions? All right. So that link, I don't know the link offhand. Um, It's kind of a, a lawn link, but it can definitely be resent out again. Um, but I do want to say that 559 responses so early on is a fantastic start for sure. Uh, Trisha, hi, it's Mark. That just to note, the the link is actually up on our website um, under op, on the front page under optometrist and optician news and resources. But we can we can definitely send it out to our listserv folks if you want to again. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Well, I have no uh, nothing further to say, so I, I am happy to um, give control back over to the board chair. Thank you, Trish. Um, so next we have and then, uh, Shara, just to correct me if I'm wrong, we wanted to obtain a motion for the strategic plan. No, there isn't a need. We also just want to make sure that we give you, as committee members, the leeway if there is action that's developed during discussion, but there is not a need for um, a motion or action today on the strategic plan item. Okay. There may be public comment, though. Of course, yes. We can open up the chat for public comment. All right. This is a moderator. I will open up the Q&A panel. All right. The Q&A panel has been opened. I will go ahead and post instructions on how to access that. Uh, if you can't see the Q&A panel, go ahead and click on the icon of a person next to three lines at the bottom of your screen and just simply uh, type in the Q&A box that you would like to make a comment and submit it to all panelists. And then we will unmute you in the order you submit your request. This is the moderator, Mr. Chair. I'm seeing no requests for public comments. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. All right, thank you. All right, so on to the 10. So looking at future agenda items. So now that we've heard all the agenda items for today, do uh, any of the committee members have any future agenda items to suggest? And then I'll, I'll just run through Anna. I didn't hear you, Anna. I don't have anything. Oh, okay. And then Bill? 
Uh, not at this time. Thank you. Okay. Um. And then staff just wanted to discuss with committee. Um, we do have a need to have a discussion agendized um, where we will make a recommendation to the board um, regarding the board member who should sit on our committee. Um, we have been told that there are currently interviews going on for um, the CLD SLD position on the board, but we do not know when that will be filled. Um, so it might be necessary to, I would, I, I, I implore the committee to think about um, making a recommendation from the existing membership of the board and then coming back to consider that again once a dispensing, or a dispensing professional has joined the board. Um, I think that the important things that you're discussing, you know, the, the discussion today around the statutes, around the regs, um, I think those are important initiatives for the committee and it's important that board members have someone who can explain the nuance of the discussion and relate to them, relate the thoughtful um, and comprehensive discussion that occurs within this committee before setting forth policy to policy recommendations to the board. Um, so I would um, like to suggest that possibly we um, set a, an additional uh, DOC committee meeting. Um, we would need about a month, or I'm sorry, pardon me, about a week in order to get the notice posted appropriately. Um, it could be no more than 10 days from that. Um, but really the backstop is that we wanna make sure that we make a recommendation to the board uh, before the beginning of August so that their review of that recommendation can be um, reviewed and approved at the uh, August 14th meeting. So we're looking at something between now and the end of July, um, a special board, uh, an independent board meeting where we would discuss um, our recommendation and make a motion on our recommendation to the board for who should be uh, uh, appointed to the committee from the board. I don't know if there's a week in July that anybody wants to throw out for a possible meeting. <laughs> I'm, I'm well, and of course it will be teleconference. So no idea what COVID will be, what will be happening at that point, but we will do teleconference. Um, we generally meet, this committee generally meets on Thursdays, but there could of course be um, leniency in that because it will simply be a, a meeting for this one item. So, yeah, so I have a quick question. What's the, what's, what's the authority for, for us making the recommendation on the member? I don't remember it being that way. Yeah, this is Will McGuire, the board council. It's um, business and professions code section 3020. And we were talking about yeah, which, it earlier today, but sorry. Which, uh, which subsection? Yeah, just, uh, I'm just refreshing the page, but I believe it's A, I'll, I'll double check. Maybe A and E read together, hold on. Um, so, so in subsection E, um, it says that after the initial appointments by the board pursuant to subdivision A, the governor shall appoint the registered dispensing optician members and the public members. The committee shall submit a recommendation to the board regarding which board members should be appointed to serve on the committee, and the board shall appoint the member to serve. Interesting. Yep, I see a plain as day there. Um, And do we have a do we have a sense of when the professional member um, will be um, reappointed to replace uh, Ruby? We do not. Um, unfortunately, the appointments process is not as transparent as we would like it to be. Um, we, of course, have been working over the last um, year as those terms came to an end in order to. Um, communicate with the governor's office regarding appointments and have a new member or have, have the existing member reappointed. Um, as they said, we were alerted earlier this week that would not occur. 
Um, we are told that interviews are taking place, but we do not know the timeline or the, um, uh, the robustness of the pool. Um, we have been asked by the governor's office to do outreach within the community. Um, so I assume that there are some good applicants that they are, uh, are uh, interviewing now, but are hoping for um, our group, our board to do additional outreach. Um, so I'm not sure when that appointment will occur. Um, and so, uh, if we decide to schedule, so in order to make the recommendation, we need to schedule a special meeting. And could we, in the special meeting, um, appoint uh, the member without the name? So this is a question for council that we need to have prepped for that meeting. Um, it says that the, com um, the committee shall submit a recommendation to the board regarding which board member should be appointed to serve on the committee, and then the board will appoint. Could our recommendation be, we recommend the, um, the public member appointed by the Senate pro tempore, whoever, whoever that member is, without identifying the individual? Could that be the recommendation, for example? In that particular example, we do not currently have a Senate appointee. Um, so that would um, yes, yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> It's just like, so could we, our recommendation be in fact for a vacant, a vacant board member? Yeah. It's, uh, the statute isn't particularly specific. I mean, it does say a board member, not a board seat, but um, I mean, if you do make that recommendation, the committee will, excuse me, the board will ultimately be making the decision. So you know, it doesn't, I don't think you're prohibited from doing it. Right. I mean, I respect that half of this is just a dance we're going to go through in a 30 minute call um, because ultimately it's going to be rest with the board and it's their decision. And um, I'd be willing to bet that they're going to decide it'll be the professional SLD member or CLD member. And they might wait six months to make that appointment, but that's just my guess. So do we have to make a motion to to authorize that future meeting or you'll you just do that as it occurs? No motion is necessary. Can, uh comment now. Items. Sure, this is the moderator. I'll go ahead and open up the Q&A panel. All right, so the Q&A panel is now open. And if any members of the public would like to make a comment, please type, I would like to make a comment in the Q&A panel and send it to all panelists. If you are not seeing the Q&A panel, click on the icon of a person next to three lines at the bottom of your screen, and we have instructions posted as well. And we'll give you a few minutes to do that. This is the moderator, Mr. Chair. I'm seeing no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. All right, thank you. Before we adjourn, Shara should be. That would be great. I would love to be able to um, let our stakeholders know now if we can, what well, we're all in one place, um, confer or confer on a potential date for this next board meeting where that item would be discussed. 
post. Um, 23rd. 23rd. Yeah, that works for me. What, what's the proposal? 23rd, 3rd Thursday, July. Um, just bear with me. I have to check how they're sitting here. <laughs> So this is just to discuss that one item. And um so like I'd need a I need uh uh, like a time on that for that day because um, I have other stuff. Um, is there a time stuff. I apologize, though. Um, is there a that would work best for you? Uh, I would say 9 to 10 or 1 to 3. Okay. Might we set the date for Thursday, July 23rd at 1 p.m.? Sounds good. Okay. Staff will work to create agenda and materials. Um, we will, um, uh, Mr. Schell, work with council to uh, explore any other sorts of, um, you know, an unnamed appointment if that is, is um, possible. We'll continue to discuss what might be um, might be prohibited or might not be prohibited. Um, again, the statute is, is limited, but um, if there are other questions that you have that legal counsel should review or research, we would appreciate those in advance so that we can we can give you uh, proper guidance. Okay. Thank you very much. For I'm sorry, Adam. Oh, I'm sorry. I said, should we move on to adjourn this? That sounds good. Thank you so very much, members. All right. Um, so, and with that, we'll close the meeting for the California State Board of Optometry Dispensing Optician Committee. So, thanks everyone for speaking and uh, our members of the public who spoke today as well. And thank you, especially the board staff and uh, Shara and Ms. Murphy for getting all of our materials uh, together and posted. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very thank much. Thank you all. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, bye.